Here we go. Even though there's there might not be many people watching us live and chatting with us, they'll be along. Um, this goes archived on YouTube almost immediately, so okay. we'll get some views. That sounds good. So, hello, everybody. This is Politics After Dark with Rachel. I'm your host, Rachel, and I have with me the lovely Nicholas Starwark, who is the executive director. No, no I'm the, the chair. chair. You're the chair. You're the chair of the Libertarian Party, the national, you're the, the big kahuna of... Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody asked one time, they said, well, what's the official position of the Libertarian Party? And I'm like, uh, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my job. So first and foremost, um, we always talk about what we're drinking. And I always go first, because ladies first. I am having a nice Pinot Grigio in my U.S. House of Representatives cup, wine glass. So, cheers. That's a solid, solid drink. I am having a Greyhound made with um, fresh grapefruits from my dad's tree and blood oranges that my daughter um, helped me juice the other night. Um, adds a little bit of sweetness to it with uh, some cheap Russian vo vodka called like Almaty Surprise. That is but beautiful. If it's sufficiently cold and it has citrus in it, you can't tell. So, cheers. Yeah. Cheers to that. We were just discussing off air how we mutually agree that um, intoxication is helpful for discussing politics. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I walked by um, the uh, one of the old party's presidential debates on my way upstairs to get on this, and I felt like I needed a drink. Yes. Good. Good. Oh, there's Charles Kennedy. Hi, Charles. I love Charles. Okay. So I have decided, not that this is like some big decision, but, you know, with Rand in the race and, you know, when he was doing well and even when he was hanging on, I was sort of leaning towards, you know, well, let's keep with the strategy of taken over the GOP and, you know, bringing it more towards liberty. But it just seems like now Rand is, is gone from the, from the GOP race. Um, and it, it's a matter of they're all worse than the other, the rest of the candidates. They're, they're all so horrible. And how do you, how do you hold your nose and pick one? And, I know I, it, it's it's long been the problem of of the Libertarian Party is getting like convincing people to stop holding your nose and just vote for somebody who's really great and that's that's the great thing that's the the appeal to me of the Libertarian slate of candidates you got three really strong candidates right now um, and it's it's a matter of they're all so great you know that's the problem with picking one of them is is they're all so great how do you pick one as opposed to in the GOP field, and frankly in the Democratic field as well, they're also horrible. How can you stand one of them? Right. So, right. We have uh, we have the worst problem to have, right? We have the problem of how do you pick between a bunch of people who want to let you live your life any way you want, as long as you don't hurt anyone and you don't take their stuff. And you have to pick between which one of those will best advocate that message. That is an awesome problem. Yeah. versus the old parties where you have this problem of who's going to take away the fewest of my rights and defend some of my rights when the other person might take away even more of my rights. And it's just, you know, it's very Ghostbusters, uh, if you remember Ghostbusters. The, uh, <clears throat> at the end of the <laughs> Ghostbusters movie, uh, you know, the Gozer shows up and says, choose the form of the destructor. And they're all supposed to not think about anybody to destroy them. And then somebody thinks of the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. The whole point of being a libertarian is we're not going to play Choose the Form of the Destructor anymore. You tell me that one of these old party people is going to run my country for four years. And it's kind of like, yeah, I guess that's probably true. But I'm not playing. I'm not going to be part of this. Y'all can do it if you want. And I was thinking about it the other day. Um, myself and a couple other Libertarian National Committee members, we often 
uh, submit to the fond embrace of the Transportation Security Agency. Basically, you guys provide a taxpayer-supported rub-and-tug for me every time I fly anywhere in the United States. <laughs> what we do is we opt out, right? We opt out. So you go through the little rapey <laughs> scan machine, and we're like, hey, I don't want to do that. I'm just going to opt out. And then you get a nice pat down from a, a TSA agent wearing his blue gloves of freedom. And, and then you go on your way, right? It takes an extra five or 10 minutes. You know, you slow down the line. They have to realize that their job involves them touching my junk. You know, it's, it's something. And the point of it is not that I can't stop them from invading my Fourth Amendment rights, right? Whether they do it through a scanner or they do it through a pat down, my Fourth Amendment rights are kind of toast because the Supreme Court has let them be toast. But what I can do is I can make it unpleasant. I can make yeah. them focus on the lack of dignity in their job. I can slow things down. I can require them to put in effort if they're going to take my rights. And I don't get to stop the thing from happening, but I get to extract the maximum amount of pain for it. It's the same as, yeah. you know, protesters, they don't jump in the paddy wagon. They lay down on the ground and they make the cops carry them. Because, yeah, yeah, you can arrest me, but you're going to carry me out of there. Yeah. And that's how I feel about old party elections. It's like, yeah, people say, well, voting libertarian, y'all aren't going to win. And I kind of wonder, like, you know, what have you won? What did you win the last time? <laughs> yeah, what have you won? <laughs> I mean, wow, that's, you that's know, vote. You got to vote for the Republicans so you control the Supreme Court because otherwise we'll have a liberal justice who will allow, you know, nationalized health care. Oh, wait. <laughs> yeah. Put a Supreme Court chief justice on there and he upheld Obamacare twice. Oh, good. You won. Good for you. Good for you. Hope you a feel better about prizes. that. Fabulous prizes. Oh, and no, so that's, I... that's the point is you don't play that game. Yeah, uh, but I, I think there's more to it than that. I, I, I mean, we, we often hear about the wasted vote, but I, I just don't see how your vote can be wasted when you're building the Libertarian Party. Maybe not this go round, but if, if we can get a formidable percentage behind the Libertarian Party for this vote count, we're that much scarier, we're that much more credible, we're that much stronger for the next go round. And plus, there's ballot access issues at stake. You know, just 2% here in North Carolina, if the presidential candidate or the, the gubernatorial candidate gets 2%, just 2%, then that saves us from having to peti petition to be reestablished as, as a party here. And, and there's thresholds like that all over the country that can be triggered by your vote. So. How, how can your vote be wasted if it actually goes towards something as meaningful as that versus, you know, trying to decide between, you know, uh, pig shit or horse shit in your shit sandwich, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's the wasted vote, in my I'd opinion. i like sandwich without shit, please. Is that, yes, that's the yeah, one I, I want. Yeah. You I, know I, what? Yeah. If I can't have, if, if you're going to tell me, if you're going to hold, hold a gun to my head, kind of like they did in the state of Oklahoma, for the last 16 years before we turned in yeah. over 42,000 signatures on Monday morning. If you're going to say, well, no, you have to pick one of the shit sandwiches. I'm not having a sandwich, man. Like yeah. I'm just not, I don't, I, I'm good. I'm not eating today. It's okay. <laughs> and that's what so many thousands of Oklahoma voters were doing. Their election turnout numbers dropped so far that even the old parties realized that they were losing the consent of the governed to the extent you ever have it. They were losing so many voters, they had to give them choice because it was crazy town. And that's, that's the, the point that I make. And I end up making this point a lot to people who kind of, you know, and, and Liberty Me may have some people in the community who have this feeling. Who, we, who we have gone, a lot of conscientious non-voters. Yes, the, the people who went from, you know, crappy old party anti-freedom all the way not, past the Libertarian Party into <laughs> not voting at all. anybody ever because, you know, don't sanction the state. And what I try and explain to them is this. If you look at voting as do I win or lose, unless you have a bookie, there's no point in picking a winner. 
If you've got a bookie who's going to pay you proper odds, then absolutely, you should figure out who the winner is going to be because that'll make you money. But <laughs> other than that, voting is a signaling mechanism. It's a way that you know I get to say, hey, this is what I want or this is what I don't want. And <clears throat> the signal you send when you vote libertarian is, I want to run my life. I don't want the government to be allowed to run my life. That's what you tell them. Yeah. That is a clear message. It is not mistakable because voting libertarian is always a vote for freedom. Yeah. If you are a conscientious, principled, anarchist, non-voter who doesn't want to participate in aggression, as Mr. Kennedy points out, no one can tell the difference between you and a dude who stayed up late playing Xbox and got high and like slept in and said, you know, eh, I don't really feel like going to the polling place today. The signal is exactly the same. That's Lazy right. ass, principled anarchist, exactly the same. And you know yeah. what? <clears throat> you both don't matter to politicians. But as yeah. a gentleman who ran for um, governor in Maryland, when I used to live there and be the state chair of that state party, said, lots of politicians are corrupt, lots of politicians are stupid, but all of them can count. <laughs> Every single one of them knows how to count. And when they count the votes next to the libertarian candidate, they know exactly how many pissed off people there are that they have to that's change their positions or they're going to lose their seat. And that's and, and the point of voting libertarian. That was what made me so pleased about election night with Sean Hawes' race, which, you know, I was very involved in, because his percentage of the vote was greater than the margin of difference between them. Right. So it sent a, a clear message that this these are the people that are available for you to court. If right. you fail to court them, this is what happens. You know, th these people win or lose the election for you. Right. You know, if you can successfully grab these people, then you could win. That's that's the message that I hope they got. And right, I they, and I think they did, and and even more, um, I I was pleased actually that the Republican won, because we are so often seen as a threat to the GOP, and we need to send the message that we are, <laughs> we are a threat to everybody. Right. <laughs> if you threaten our liberties, you know, um, we can take votes away from Democrats too. <laughs> so. We are out of control, angry rattlesnake sitting on a yellow flag. And, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll bite the hell out of you and we'll probably kill you. Um, no, it's, it's uh, you know, people say that that's the spoiler vote, that you spoiled the election. First of all, you can't spoil rotten meat. You know, if you have, if you have crappy choices, it doesn't matter which crappy choice you end up with. Uh, the second thing, you. though, is <laughs> you, you call it spoiling. I call it I control the election. You know, yeah. I talked to a, yeah. a potential candidate in Washington state who is now filed for the upcoming 2016 elections. She came over from the Republicans and uh, her precinct captain told her, she's like, don't burn libertarian. You'll never be able to win. You're just going to, you know, waste your time, blah, blah, blah. And I said, look, if you get 5%, 10% of the vote that you're polling, you're not, neither of those other candidates are in control of the election. You are. You control the entire election. You decide who wins. Yeah. You want to talk about controlling winners and losers. The person that controls the middle controls all of it. Yes. When you have yes. a, a house where it's, you know, 50 or 48 senators on one side and 48 senators on the other side and two independents. Did I do that math right? I think I did. No, four independents. No, 49, 49, and two. That's what I uh -huh. meant. Uh -huh. 49, 49, and two. Those <laughs> two senators literally control the entire chamber. And it's that's true. the power that libertarians need to realize they have. Mm -hmm. We speak for the people, the people who want to be left alone, the people who want to raise their kids, build their businesses, pursue happiness however they want, and not the American have the way. government involved. Mm -hmm. We stand up for them, and we're the only ones who do. Yeah. And because we only stand up for them, because that's why we're in it. We're not in it for money. We're not in it for special interest favors. We're not in it for power or for winning. 
then we make sure that when we control the election, freedom wins. Right. Liberty wins. That's why we're in it. And that's what makes the Libertarian Party different. It's like, you know, people have told me that the the seven up ads that they had back in the seventies, the uncola. We're the unpolitical party. Like <laughs> we're not like other political parties. And that's why all of the principled non voting anarchists should really check their premises and rethink what they're doing. Because what they're doing is not effective. You know, and it doesn't you don't have to go down the road of saying, well, you know, if you won, you'd use aggression or anything like that. You have to look, take it, take it from where we're at, right? People say, well, you're never going to win. Okay. Well, then it's perfectly acceptable to take 10 minutes out of your Tuesday to send a very clear message to the people who do win. That even if Loud they did win. Loud and clear. Loud and clear. Remember. When I was in um, Oklahoma <clears throat> for that press conference, I stopped by a couple of senators' offices. And I did some very quick lobbying. And I, I'm pretty focused when I lobby because I know they don't really care what I'm saying anyway. And I said, look, you know, I'm the chair of the Libertarian Party. We're in town for a press conference. We just turned in the signatures of over 42,000 Oklahomans who want the Libertarians on the ballot, who care about, in this case, it was civil asset forfeiture. They care about ah. this issue. There's this bill that is being bottled up in committee and it's not even getting a hearing. And so I just wanted to let you know that there are over 42,000 Oklahomans who really care about this issue, who will be voting Libertarian in November, who are watching to see if you give this bill a hearing. And then I gave them my card and I said, you have had any questions, you give me a call. And then I left because that's all they need to know, right? Fantastic. What's your position? How many people do you control? And then we're done. You yeah, know, keep it super polite. It's it. not, you know, everything else isn't going to make it to the senator anyway. That's beautiful. Yeah, I was going to ask you more about Oklahoma because that's actually a really momentous thing. If anybody's watching this and doesn't know, Oklahoma um, is one of the toughest states for ballot access. I think it's the toughest, isn't it? It is the toughest. Um, it became and less tougher because of some very good work by the Oklahoma party and the national committee stepped in with some cash and a lobbyist right at the last minute. Uh, if you know legislation, conference committees are where you kill bills. So you get them passed out of one house, and then the conference committee is like, eh, we couldn't really come up with something we agreed on, so you lose. We're done. So we made sure that we got it to the governor's desk and got it signed. And then we raised a lot of money. I think we spent in excess of $100,000 to make sure that Oklahomans could have the same choice that every American should have. The Just right to send to, a message to, on, to the day, on the one day that it counts. On the one day when they're actually listening to you and it's not some pollster that, oh, we don't know about their methodology and what's the margin of error. No, they're actually listening to you on election day. Right. And every state around Oklahoma through all those election cycles going back to 2000, which is the last time we were on the ballot there, they've had a libertarian option. So why should Oklahomans be denied the rights that their neighbors have? Like why... I mean, yeah. it's America, isn't it? I, I thought it was. I, I, I don't think we lost a war recently. Like, <laughs> you know, you would think you'd have this right. And that's why I'm committed personally, and we're poised to achieve it, to have 50 state plus District of Columbia ballot access in 2016. I firmly believe that it is our duty as libertarians to give every single American a libertarian option in November. Every American should have the ability to walk into that ballot booth and say, you know what, I'm done with the old parties. I'm done with Democrats. I'm done with Republicans. I'm done with flip-flopping back and forth to see if it'll get better. I'm just done. And I want to make sure that every time a voter has that moment, has that realization, has that epiphany, the scales drop from their eyes and they're ready to vote for freedom instead of voting their fear, that they have a libertarian there. Because there's this thing yeah. called the wasted vote. And the wasted vote isn't, you know, voting for someone who can't win. The wasted vote is when that person walks in that booth and says, I want freedom, and there's not and a libertarian for them to vote for. That's ah, a wasted vote. That's, we exist to give yes. voice to the voiceless. We don't want power. We don't want money. We want nothing more 
than the, the natural rights to freedom and liberty and happiness that our, our forefathers died to put forth on this country. That's all we want. We want yeah. the statement of principles that it says, we seek nothing more or less than a world set free in our lifetime. Yeah. Um, I'm going to tell you, though, what my fear is, though, and why I think this year is, is so critical for the libertarian moment. And I think it really could be the libertarian moment. If you look at the slate of candidates that's left, oh, my gosh. You know, it, it's like everything is lining up to, like, tremendous. Funnel, tremendous. to funnel all of this energy into the libertarian party right now. And that energy has to go somewhere. And it, it doesn't need to go to Ted Cruz. I mean, please, <laughs> really? Ah, uh, ah, uh, yeah. just, I mean, ah, yeah. uh. but I mean, He's here's the thing, I, I think we need to build the Libertarian Party, but we need to build it fast and hard, like this cycle, 2016, we need to Absolutely. build it fast and hard, because if we, if we build it incrementally, if we just make a little baby step, another little baby step, a polite little, you know, please, can I have some freedom, um, then they're going to do like, look, remember what the GOP did in Tampa. You know, they, they changed the rules and they just sort of canceled out all of all of the Ron Paul activist efforts. Just, you know, gone. And I, I worry that if we give them too much of a warning, too much of an opportunity, too much of a, you know, of a, of a shake up without, you know, something really big, then then they're they're going to figure out how to shift the sand underneath the political ground in order to you know just make it that much harder they're they're going to feel too threatened so i mean there needs well, to be like, yeah There's, they're gonna I mean, exactly to be, <laughs> let's put a fine point <laughs> on it i'm right? trying to say you're gonna cheat one of the dudes that's downstairs on my other tv my wife got a there's a booze delivery service in phoenix that she's trying out because if she's gonna you know if you have to watch that, you, you need extra. Um, Booze delivery? Yeah, it's called Minibar. It's actually pretty cool. It's like, you know, <laughs> it's like uh, Grubhub for booze. Wow. Yeah, it comes right to your door. Um, anyway, there's a dude at the end of that stage. Uh, you may know him. He's the one that talks like he's karate chopping with that weird Pittsburgh accent. Casey? Uh, yeah, that's the guy. Yeah. I never remember their names. Karate Chop. <laughs> yeah, Mr. they made Robot. Fruit Ninja videos with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Swipe, 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 swipe. Um, <laughs> he is probably one of the better known candidates on that stage to me, but he's known to me because his cronies cheated with both hands to knock the Libertarian candidate off the ballot in 2014 in Ohio. They got a dupe to be a plaintiff in a lawsuit that was filed and funded by a guy who officially wasn't related to the governor's office, but through discovery, we found out actually was on the payroll and all the money was funneled through the Republicans to cheat to get us off the ballot. And wow. they knocked the Libertarian Party of Ohio off the ballot through cheating, but the courts have allowed that to stand. And that's the sort of thing that we deal with. I mean. We have at the National Party both a legal defense mm. fund and a legal offense fund, and we strategize over this stuff, and we sue over this stuff because, you know what, this ain't beanbag, right? You know, everyone's like, oh, the Libertarian Party is a debating society. No, we're a real political party, and my background, at least for one of my careers, comes out of litigation, and I get it, you know? This is not beanbag, and I don't expect any quarter, and I don't expect to give any. Um, so, you know, right now we're in the midst of a, a lawsuit against Kentucky Educational Television because they blocked our Senate candidate from being in the debate with McConnell um, by changing the rules at the last minute and sort of back testing them to make sure that they would block the Libertarian out in clear uh. violation of the First Amendment with public money. Um, you know, we've got two different si suits against the Commission on Presidential Debates, one that Gary Johnson's involved in, one that the um, the gentleman who ran Americans Elect is involved in. Um, we've joined on to both. And, you know, we don't agree with the Americans Elect people on a lot, 
but we agree with them that the Commission on Presidential Debates is, as the League of Women Voters said, a fraud on the American people and a collusion in order to exclude other voices. It's a bipartisan, you know, shell game. And so we're fighting back and we will continue to fight back. The thing about the libertarians that I want everybody to know and understand <clears throat> is we care more about this country than the people in the old parties. We actually have principles that we're fighting for. We're demographically younger than the people in the old parties, so we're going to last longer, and we will never, ever, ever give up. So every time, every time I talk to you, I like you more and more. <laughs> <laughs> You're the greatest. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. The Libertarian Party has found a good guy in Nicholas Starwark, and I think all of my viewers should give ten or fifty dollars, whatever you can, right now, because LP. this is a good guy. <laughs> join, join us up. This is a good guy. But I, there was one thing I wanted to talk to you about. I want, I wanted to discuss before we go. Yeah. Um, my next guest is is uh, coming on in just a few minutes. But debates, the Libertarian yeah. Party, we're going to have televised presidential debates for like the first time ever. And it's, it's very exciting. Awesome. Yeah. Give us a promo. So What's we got happening? two things, two things going on. Two yeah. things. Um, tomorrow night after I get home from work, I get on a red eye to Atlanta and then a morning flight Saturday to Biloxi or Gulfport, but Biloxi, Mississippi. And we are having a, a debate. That's going to be a three-camera shoot with professional moderators put on by the parties of Alabama and Mississippi at the Beau Rivage Casino. Mm -hmm. 25 bucks for tickets. We're inviting non-libertarians to come, as many as want to come, because I guarantee you, I promise you, that one of those men on that stage, men or women, actually, there's both, will be on the general election ballot, as opposed to the, the gentleman from uh, Florida who... Uh, pissed away $160 million of his donor's money and isn't going to be on the general election. <laughs> his initials are Jeb Bush. <laughs> it could be, could be. I hate to use names. Um, as opposed to that, we will have a candidate on the general election ballot, probably of every single American, and one of the, the, the people on the stage in Biloxi will be on that ballot. It's going to be live streamed at mslp.org slash debate. It's going to be packaged together and edited so that it can go out on YouTube afterwards. And so it's going to be an awesome time with and all of the candidates who are seeking the nomination, of which I believe there are 12 right now, have been invited because, you know, we sort of, we believe in open debates and so we're having an open debate. Good for you. The other, the other thing that's happening is, uh, my understanding is John Stossel on Fox Business is putting together a televised debate um, that's going to come up in the next month or so He's inviting less candidates than that. I don't know how many he's inviting. It's kind of, you know, it's one of those things where it's up to him, right? It's his show. This isn't a CPD thing. This is more of a free speech thing. So he invites who he thinks is going to get right. good TV ratings. But like you point out, the best part about it is we're in a place right now where having a Libertarian Party presidential debate gets you TV ratings, right? That's yeah. the election we're in now. That's a thing that you put on TV to put, eyes on the screen, and that's the thing that, you know, we've needed to understand about our relationship with the media for so long. Some reporters hate us, right? They're going to stifle us because they don't want to hear from us, and that's, you know, it is what it is. But some reporters just don't cover us because it's boring. It's not going to sell any newspapers or website eyeballs or whatever, and we're past that. We're at the point now where the Libertarian Party race is exciting. It's something people are interested in. And as the old parties sort of rush headlong to their own demise and drive, you know, 100 miles an hour into that wall and try and self-implode, the interest in the Libertarian Party just gets bigger and bigger. It's, it's, it's huge. I mean, you know, I think that's yes. a word that you use this yes. election cycle. Huge. Huge. China. <laughs> it's huge. China. <laughs> Wow. So it's going to be awesome, um, um, and I think that that's kind of, you know, the, this thing on Saturday in Biloxi is going to be great to sort of kick off the debate season, and then we're going to have an exciting ride up to the Libertarian National Convention in Orlando over Memorial Day weekend, 
where we're going to have an actual contested convention like the libertarians always do. We put our nomination <laughs> up to actual delegates from actual state parties who yeah. get to do retail politics with the candidates and decide who they think is best going to bring that freedom message out to the country. And it's going to be awesome. I encourage everybody to come there. You know, we've got a thousand seats or so in the delegate hall, but it's Orlando, right? Like my kids are going yeah. to Disney World when I go. It's going to be it's going to be great. That, and so I hope I everybody to. will either join the Libertarian Party. It's lp.org. Come to the convention. Support our candidates. Throw a couple dollars our way for ballot access. I mean, if you look at it, if if I have a bu I have a budget of like four hundred thousand dollars or so that I got to raise this election cycle and I'll have a libertarian candidate preaching a freedom message on literally every American's ballot in the entire country and some dude from Florida pissed away hundred and sixty million dollars for exactly nothing so Zero. if you want to talk yes. return on investment <laughs> and I run a business return on investment with the libertarian party is way better than with the old parties yeah. and so that's kinda where we're at I'm looking forward to going to Orlando. I'm hoping to be a delegate. So, awesome. Yeah. So, and and my kids are going to be doing the same thing, going to Disney World. So. Absolutely. And I think my wife is going to like try and set something up to do like a craft with the kids and stuff. You know? Really? Yeah, yeah. I think we're either going to do Statue of Liberty things or like torches. You oh, know, if, we, if there's we've got a hospitality stuff, suite, so we'll use it for some family stuff. Like Yay. we need it to be more open and welcoming to to families. I think. I mean, you know, the the Libertarian Party for a long time has been way too white, and way too male, and maybe a little old. And so, if we can move <laughs> that needle a little bit, just by being a little more open to it, like you know, I got kids, you got kids, yeah. a lot of us have kids. So let's make it so that the people with kids, you know, have feel like time. they're part of the party too. Yeah. I mean, it'll awesome. be fun. It's gonna be great. I'm so excited. excited. I'm excited. so excited. I'm excited. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Nicholas Sarwark. Thank you so um, much for having me. Yeah, it was a pleasure. I hope you'll come back sometime as, as we get further in. Um, and Jason Dietz, how do you pronounce your name, Jason? Uh, it's Dietz. Jason Dietz has joined us. Welcome, Jason. You are on the show. It is great to have you. Well, thank um, you for having me. Nicholas, you can drop off any time or you can participate however you choose. I'm so. gonna hang out. I'll, I'll hang out for about this long. Yeah, yeah. That, that works for you. That, long. that works for me. Jason, are you drinking anything? Uh, just water. Just water? Okay. So healthy, making us look bad. Okay, have it your way. Yes, it's great to make his choices. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, um, Jason, thank you very much for joining us. You are the news editor for Antiwar.com. Yes. And uh, your recent article uh, that you posted was very interesting. It was about, this is the way I described it, and you, and you can give a synopsis of your own if you uh, don't mind, but the way I described it was how the war on terror is catering to the interests of central bankers. Is that fair? Oh, absolutely. And uh, I think that's sort of been the tale of a lot of wars, that the central bankers look to see how they can take the best advantage of it. And this time around, with all the talk of uh, cutting ISIS's funding off, getting the money away from ISIS, it's it's turned into, into an outright war on cash. Now, but war on cash, what, what does that mean? War on cash. Well, it's sort of vague right now. We see a lot of articles in recent days, the last few weeks, talking about the need to get rid of large denomination currency. So Things it's like, like actual cash, like paper bills, like trying to get rid of like paper bills. Right. Uh, there, there have been several articles. Uh, the Financial Times had an article arguing that paper money is simply obsolete and we should do away with it outright. Uh, Lawrence Summers, former Treasury Secretary, had an article in the Washington Post saying, well, we could at least get rid of the 100 and the 50 because that would be a good first step towards uh, sort of eliminating the, well, what he called the tax evader economy. And he presented the idea that $100 bills, having a $100 bill is basically evidence that you're 
a drug dealer or some sort of criminal that <laughs> normal people just wouldn't have a hundred dollar bill. So really, it's not trackable. They don't like it because they can't control it and track it. And, well, and right, and that's that's and definitely big. big. Like they want it to be big. They want you to have to have like big suitcases and garbage bags if you want to buy anything. <laughs> well, no, seriously, know, that's, that's what that's, they want. That, that's Bernanke, <laughs> they, they and now and now Janet have to Yellen. Have, like they... a trunk of of cash, because if you have big bills, then you can like pack them in a suitcase. They want you to have to have two suitcases. Like, they literally don't want you to have big bills because it's too easy to buy stuff. You think so, Jason? Uh, I think that's part of it, yeah. I, I think the uh, a big part of it, at least from the central banker's perspective, is also that the interest rate is basically capped at zero at this point. You can't have an interest rate below zero. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. They're working on it. They're doing it in Japan. They're doing it in Europe. Well, you can try, but... Negative interest rates, yes. You can try, but so long as there's this cash economy out there, people can avoid losing their money to negative interest rates by simply holding cash. Right. I mean, That's, the bank yeah. accounts... If your bank account starts charging you for the right to have your money stored, you're just not going to store your money with that bank anymore. Or yeah, or or what they want is for you to just spend it into the economy and increase the velocity of money, which makes the you know all of the economic indicators look better. But you know, in reality, it destroys capital and puts you in debt. So, um, and and the war on terror is just an excuse to sort of enable all of this. Yes. Absolutely. I, I mean, we had articles last week and the week before that were claiming ISIS. Their entire economy is U.S. dollar denominated, which is simply not true. But it's also just the latest in a series of articles like that that just sort of come up with whatever, whatever denom, whatever sort of money that is sort of being villainized at the moment. There have been articles about oh, ISIS is using a lot of Bitcoin. Oh, ISIS is uh, accepting tax payments in gold. That was a, a big deal. Now it's ISIS is using uh, U.S. dollars. And and this week we had another article claiming that ISIS was taking advantage of uh, their control over currency exchange in Mosul by charging a higher uh, exchange rate for Iraqi dinars than uh, the Iraqi government does. I, I'm yeah. They're they're like the redheaded stepchild ISIS. It's, it's like whatever they want to um, beat on, whatever they want to whip up into a frenzy, they'll they'll find a way to tie it to ISIS and terrorism. And but I mean, <sighs> right. And it doesn't really matter what they choose. Uh, there's always some way to link it to ISIS or to some other group. Uh, earlier in the war on terror, we saw a lot of, uh, oh, the Taliban is linked to the drug trade, so we need to really st step up the war on drugs to kind of get the money away from the Taliban. Now that now that it's shifted to ISIS, there was, for a few weeks there, a push to bomb uh, oil trucks leaving the country, leaving Syria, and the idea that those oil trucks were going to make money for ISIS. After that didn't work, then it was, well, we're bombing buildings in Mosul that we believe have a large amount of physical cash in them. So, um, what's the solution? Not that any, not that any politician's going to listen and take it, but what, what, in your opinion, would be the best course of action from here? As far it, as fighting ISIS is concerned? No, I mean, as, as far as... Um, just sort of backing off of all of this and returning to sanity. Wow, that's that's a big question because we're a long <laughs> way from sanity right now. Yeah, I, I can't even imagine. Uh, I mean, certainly getting the Pentagon spending under control would be a big step in that direction because there's just so much money in these sort of overseas contingency operation slush funds that nominally go for one thing, but that the Pentagon can basically spend on whatever they want. And and that means that Congress really doesn't have as much control over the military as they historically have. Yeah. 
So what do you think is really going on with ISIS? And I mean, they, they seem to be like this boogeyman for like everything we want to vilify. Um, are they really a big scary threat, or I mean, what do you what do you think? It, are, are they just an excuse for taking well, liberty? In a lot of ways, they're an excuse, and I think ISIS is a threat to the extent that we make them a threat. Right. It really seems like the more the U.S. and other countries launch airstrikes and sort of push against uh, push against ISIS, try to prevent them from uh, operating in their what really amounts to a, a state right now, an independent state, uh, that ISIS is going to keep lashing out and retaliating. And at some point, I, I think if ISIS is left to its own devices, they haven't really done a great job of managing their territory. I think they would just burn out. They wouldn't be able to attract recruits without all these wars going on. And I don't think they could survive peacetime. <laughs> they really couldn't. Because in peace, there's an economy, and there's jobs, and there, there's other opportunities. And it seems like, from everything I've read, ISIS relies on recruitment efforts from a lack of other economic opportunities. You know, you, you read about all of these young guys with families and, and um, there's nothing else to do except I, ISIS, you know, or a group like that offers a paycheck and they've got to support a family. So, you know, I don't know nothing about the Koran. I don't care. But, you know, I'll sign up and go do what I have to do to support my family. So... Right, and this narrative of a uh, major religious war is sort of built into a lot of the major religions, including Islam. And so long as ISIS can present the current war as that war, this huge civilization-defining uh, conflict, they're going to have access to these recruits. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's what soldiers on both sides fight for, is like existential questions of God and country. If you can't convince people that that's what you're fighting for, you don't have a war, pretty much. You've got to gin up this feeling of God and country, or Allah and country, as the case may be. Um, potato, potato. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. But yeah, that that, and and I then mean, that sort of justifies the decision that they make, which is really economic. And it's the same thing over on on our end. It's like you, you go, we we've got um, the the G the GI Bill, so you can get free education. You know, you can get you know VA loans uh, for homes, and you know of course you got the the paycheck and the health care and everything. You know, I mean. Tell me a lot of our soldiers aren't the same sort of mercenaries, you know, just looking for a, I mean, maybe not, maybe mercenary is, is a little bit harsh, but, you know, they're looking for economic opportunities that don't exist um, elsewhere in the, the economy for them. So, you know, they're, they're, they're making an economic decision and justifying it with, you know, religion and patriotism. Oh, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, we see a lot of... Uh a lot of the recruitment efforts in the United States for the military go after the poorest people in the country because they're the people that have the fewest alternatives to it. Yeah. Especially with the war making the economy as bad as it's been at some times, it's been awfully easy for them to go into high schools and just sell the idea that, well, you're not going to get any other kind of job, so you might as well be a soldier and go to college in a few years. Yeah. Or you're not going to get drafted into the NFL, so you might as well be a soldier and be a real hero, which is, you know, the message that the NFL is being so helpful in sending. Yeah, so I think Pat Tillman may be a counterexample. Count, yeah, maybe a ca but just one, <laughs> not many. <laughs> yeah, but whacked by friendly fire, that was really not a good way to go out. No, absolutely not. Um, but anyway, we are up against our time limit, so I'm going to say thank you very much to you two gentlemen, Jason Ditz and Nicholas Sarwark, for thank joining me. Thank you so much me. for having us. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is a fantastic, fantastic episode, and very excited to have you both with me. Very good discussion, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Good night, everybody. Bye.